So today we're going to go over a couple of last things for cardiac. We're, I'm not going to go into some of the rhythms that I'll save later, more advanced rhythms like ventricular rhythms or junctional rhythms. I'll do that for another stream. Maybe next week I'll do that with the EKG. Any rate, today is not going to be uh, one where we have questions from NCLEX or TCRN just so that I'm not going to run over too much with the stream so that I can work tomorrow and get some sleep before it. The other thing is if you have any questions, type it in the chat. I want to make this really interactive. I'm still hoping that we'll get there where it can be a live study session. But uh, for now, we're going to talk about other things. Nobody really asked any questions or brought anything up on any of the messages that I could get. Nobody wrote me messages, actually. At any rate, we'll just get started. Uh, okay. Oh, I also, I did a little bit different uh, PowerPoint or streaming background because I wanted to switch it up a little bit so it's not plain black. So you're not seeing things on your screen. I wanted to make it different looking. So the font's different, the background's a little bit different, and there's some funny things in this one too. Nerd funny if you're into that, which you would be because you're all here on a live study session. Okay, let's get started. Enough talking. Okay, so today, what I kind of went into last week we did 12 lead EKGs last week, and there's a way where you can see a 15 lead EKG, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And then we're also going to, ooh, marking up my screen. I'm also going to talk about pacemakers and um, a AICD or ICD, which is a defibrillator, internal defibrillator that some patients will have. We'll talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to just review what we've talked about the last few weeks. Now, I will tell you on my YouTube channel, Twitchy Nurse YouTube, I have all the cardiac serial, uh, maybe not last week's, but all the basic EKG and the heart block one up on uh, YouTube. So go check that out so that you kind of have a good base when we start looking at rhythms um, next week. I'm really, I'm sleepy, so just bear with me. But we're going to review over kind of what we went over the last few weeks um, and then go into looking at what they look like as well. But go to YouTube, check out those videos. I try to upload all the streams that I do to YouTube so that way if you've missed a stream or you want to share something with somebody you can. Okay so this is everyone talks about insurance and I thought this was funny it's kind of cheesy but this guy's gonna get a hamster placed in him for a pacemaker like a squirrel on a wheel. Okay so 15 lead EKG. Why do we want to do a 15 lead? And a 15 lead is going to look at the back of the heart. Well, can't we tell what the front uh, from the front of the heart what the back of the heart is doing? I talked a little bit about this last week that sometimes the anterior leads, which is two, three, and four, they I, you can't see me very well. There, two, three, and four are here. They look at the front part of that heart. So sometimes when you see a change here, it's talking about the opposite in the back. So why can't we just look at a, the back of the heart and guess what's happening from the 12 lead? Well, you don't want to leave heart muscle up to chance or guessing, right? And sometimes the 12 lead is going to look normal, but the patient is having symptoms of um, a myocardial infarction or a, a heart attack. And so you just want to check that out. It's not going to 
be too hard. So it just, peace of mind, you wanna check out the, the posterior part of the heart. So that's really important to at least know how to do. And some people, you know, lives have been saved this way. Uh, I think I read an article that even though most of the heart attacks occur either in the lateral or inferior, um, a lot of the uh, posterior ones don't get reperfused as quickly. And that, if you remember, time is muscle. So the more time we wait, the more heart muscle dies. So it doesn't take too much time to do a 15 lead. And so you should just do it. So again, why do we do it? The 12 lead doesn't really show that there's a, a MI going on and the patient is having symptoms of that. Or you do see some changes on the 12 lead in the anterior part, which would be reciprocal of the back part. So the anterior part is showing some ST depression. Then you wanna do 15 lead to see if there's ST elevation in the posterior heart. So how do we do this? If you remember, lead four is midclavicular line. And what you do is you switch that to the other side of the body. So the left side, I'm sorry, the right side of your body, midclavicular. And it's gonna be called V4R. Then you're gonna move five and six to the back and it'll be eight and nine. You can also move three back there to make seven, B7, but eight and nine is, is sufficient. A 15, a true 15 lead is gonna have seven, eight, and nine. So take three, five, and six and move it to the back. I think it's three. At any rate, five and six is gonna be B8 and B9. And those are where you're gonna see the changes for the posterior heart. So here's our guy from last week. We put the leads on him. We put, we put the right arm up here, the left arm up here on the legs. We put the right leg, put the left leg. And then we have V1, V2, we put V4 on, V3 goes in between two and four, and then we have six mid axillary line, and then five, oops, five between four and six. So what you do is you take lead four, and you just move it on over to the mid clavicular line on the other side. So that's V4R. And there's some EKGs that you can do where this, V2 becomes V1, and then you can look at the other side, the right side of the heart, by just placing the leads on the other side, like a, a mirror. Like if you were to put a mirror at the, this guy's sternum, you would put two, or this will be V2, blah, 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 start over. V2 would be V1, and then you would put three, and then four would be in the middle, five and six, and that would look at the right side of the heart. But for right now, we're, ta we're not talking about the right side of the heart, we're talking about the back of the heart. So let's take that off. Um, then we take five and six, and where you place these on the back are, are very is very important. So your land markers, you're gonna put five, First, you're gonna, that's gonna be seven. B8, so lead five, you're gonna put, you're gonna take your hand, you're gonna run it down your patient's shoulder blade and right at the bottom of the, the tip of that shoulder blade, you're going to put V5. And that is what's gonna be V8. And then V6, you're gonna take and find the spine in between V8 and the spine, you're gonna place V6 lead and it's gonna be V9. I know there's a lot of numbers flying around, but no, there you go. 
but technically if you were doing a 12 lead this here would be v5 this would be v6 but since it's a 15 lead we already did our 12 lead we take five and six off we put five under the shoulder blade making v8 and then v9 between the shoulder blade placement one and the spine so that would that is where you put your leads for a 12 lead so what does this look like so first we get our 12 lead so here's lead one two or yeah lead we're looking at one two three we got avr remember that's looking at the center of the heart out to the right center of the heart out to the left avf center of the heart down towards the foot then we got one two three four five six those leads there then we switch to the back and we have seven eight and nine so this is what a 15 lead would look like. It's a very old EKG. Looks like somebody put this in their pocket and all the ink came off, but then they went ahead and drew over the EKG. But at any rate, what this shows, if we look at this, if you remember, V2, V3, V4, is what looks at the anterior heart. And what do you see there? You see some ST depression. Everything should go back to this isoelectric line. Here's the isoelectric line. However, these are depressed. So if those are depressed, it would make sense that when we look at the back of the heart, we're gonna see an elevation. And what do you know as we look in the back of the heart, here's the isoelectric line. We have an elevation, we have an ST elevation. So this patient is having a posterior MI, posterior ischemia, posterior heart attack. The heart attack is occurring at the back of the heart. Let's look at some more. So here's our 12 lead. This is the uh, limb leads. Got one, two, three. AVR, AVL, AVF. Everything looks okay, right? And this is gonna show you why you need to do 15 leads on patients who are symptomatic or have symptoms of an MI or heart attack and their 12 lead looks okay. So, so far this looks okay. There's no elevations. Everything looks almost like normal sinus rhythm. Let's look at the limb or the precordial precordial leads. Again, there's no real uh, um, ST elevation. Everything comes back to the isoelectric line, and it if if you were just to read a 12 lead, you'd be like, oh, this guy has normal sinus rhythm. He's just having some chest pain. No big deal. Well, if you're smart and you remember this stream. What you're gonna do is you're gonna say, let's let's just run a 15 lead. Let's just, we're already here. Let's go ahead and do that. What happens? Look at this. There's some elevation, V8 and V9. So we would, if, if we didn't do the 12 lead, if we didn't do labs, if we didn't do anything, we didn't see any troponin markers, which is, if troponin is elevated, it's a, it is indicative, indicative, sorry, indicative of a, of a heart attack. If we were just to send this patient home, he would have had dead, uh, dead heart tissue because he is having a posterior MI. So, looks normal. The whole 12 lead looks normal, looks normal, normal sinus, and then we see this, the STEMI in the back of the heart. So the point I'm trying to drive home is if your patient is having chest pain and it, it uh, walks like a duck, it sounds like a duck, then it's probably a duck. You need to find out where it's at. Go ahead, do a 15 lead EKG and just make sure that it's not a heart attack happening in the back of their heart. You could save some lives. Okay, are we done? Okay, let's talk about pacemakers.
EKGs are fun. I love it. Pacemakers. And automated implantable defibrillators or ICDs or AICDs. These are implanted devices. They're, they're thin, but they're probably about the size of that. Sometimes they're a little bit smaller, but they sit in the chest and then the wires will go into the heart and I'll show you pictures. But why do people need pacemakers? A lot of times they'll need pacemakers if they have a irregular or they have an arrhythmia or a lot of times people who have heart failure, their heart stretches out and there can be some asynchrony. They're not syncing together. The ventricles are not pumping together. And that can lead to blood flow not being effectively pushed out. So when we put pacemakers in the patients who have enlarged hearts from heart failure, it helps synchronize the ventricle so that more blood is being effectively pushed out. So those are two reasons that we would give a patient a pacemaker. There's arrhythmias, like they're bradycardic, uh, they have a certain heart block, and it also keeps the heart, the ventricles in sync when the patient's heart is enlarged from heart failure. Now an AICD will shock the patient during certain rhythms. For example, if the patient goes into sudden VTAC or VFib after a certain number of beats, it will shock the patient. And I've had patients um, come to the hospital because they passed out at home and the reason being is because they were in VTAC and their AICD shocked. My patient yesterday, one of them, that's actually what happened to him is he passed out, he fell down actually really hurt his hip pretty bad but he fell down and his pacemaker shocked him another patient i had i it wasn't my patient i'm sorry another patient that i saw was when i was working i was working one day and she was in the cardiac icu and it was around the corner the cardiac icu is around the corner from my unit so the beds go from 20, 21, 22, and then 23 around the corner starts the CT ICU or the cardiothoracic ICU. And she was sitting in room 223, and I was down the hall probably like 218, 219 before that, that uh, turn to go to CT ICU. And all I heard was yelling, just, ow, ow, help me, help me. And I went in the room, and she was in... VTAC. She was in VTAC. And what was going on is her ICD was shocking her. Now, why wasn't she passed out? She had a cardiac device called an impella. And what that was doing is it was keeping her blood flowing while she was in VTAC. So she was able to stay awake but during all of this, even though she, her heart was not working right. So her heart, she just kept shocking. Her pacemaker just kept shocking, shocking her. We ended up um, sedating her and, and intubating her so she wasn't so uncomfortable. But yeah, she could feel every single shock every time it shocked her. So it's, it was very interesting to see. Um, one, because I was able to see the AICD in action. Not that I haven't seen it before, but on, on a person who wasn't intubated it was very interesting it was it was a little cool it was cool I know that sounds mean but it was cool to see it in action even though it was it was hurting her it was saving her life and then it was also neat to see how the whole code happened with the impella going on and I'm very excited to talk about cardiac devices with you guys because they're just so interesting in how they, they help augment and help support our vascular system and cardiac system. It's just our circulatory system. It's just, it's very cool. At any rate, those are the two times I've, I've really dealt with AICDs. And the thing about pacemakers and AICDs is that 
anyone, no matter what unit you're on, you can get a patient with that. We have patients as young as 20s having this because their heart has, they have a heart defect from birth or whatnot. We have older people with this. So it's really important that you're familiar with pacemakers and you ask certain questions like, hey, what kind of pacemaker do you have? Do you know what it does for your heart? Does it shock you as well? And I don't ask really, you know, does this, is, do you have a, a defibrillator as well? I'll just ask, does it shock you too if you need it? So anyway, it's important to find out because if your patient starts the code, you already have a defibrillator working, hopefully. So this is what this looks like. So you can have just a pacemaker. If you have a rhythm that you don't need any shocks delivered, you can have the pacemaker and it's smaller. And then you can have an ICD or AICD, which means you don't need the pacer. You don't, your heart doesn't need to be paced, but oftentimes you may go into a lethal rhythm that you drop dead from and this will kick in and shock you. And then we've got the CRTD and what this basically is is a combo one. So this has a pacemaker and an ICD with it. So this one is the, the combination one. And what does it look like on the chest wall? Well, when you do your skin assessment, it, oftentimes they'll sit up here on the left side and it'll look like this. You can feel it. It's right under the skin. Off, sometimes you can see the wires. These are wires starting to go into the, the vein. And then this little device here is the pacemaker or ICD or combination one. Sometimes you'll see it on the other side of the chest, but here you can see it here. A lot of times I'll have patients come in and they don't really tell me what their history is and I'll see that and be like, oh, do you have a pacemaker? What kind is it? Does it shock you? So types of pacemakers. We have a single chamber one and that only deals with one part of the heart, the atrium, the right atrium. We have a dual chamber and that would mean that it has the atrium and the ventricle. So the right atrium and the right ventricle. We have biventricular and those are the ones that we see in our heart failure patients because it, sh uh, it uh, delivers electrical impulses to both ventricles to keep them in sync. Sometimes you have all of them. You have the atrium and you have the ventricles. So as you can see, this is really blurry, but here's the pulse generator is the pacemaker. They put the wires through this vein, the subclavian vein, left subclavian, down through the superior vena cava and into the heart. So here, this is a single chamber and it attaches right here. The dual chamber attaches here and down here. And then for biventricular, it attaches here, it attaches here, and then you got the, um, the right atrium here. Better picture here. The wires go through, through that uh, subclavian, the left subclavian, and it can go through the right, but the left subclavian that comes down here and it can attach here for the right atrium for single chamber. If you got dual chamber, attaches down here. And then for biventricular, you're gonna attach here on the left and then there on the right. One important thing is oftentimes when you take a patient to MRI, MRI, you need to find out if their pacemaker is compatible with the MRI because these wires are metal. So if it's not compatible, what can happen is 
the mag the big massive magnet that has that is being used in MRI can actually dislodge and move these wires and they can migrate other places. So you want to make sure if your patient has a pacemaker that you don't send them down to MRI without first checking to make sure it's compatible. And they do make some pacemakers that are compatible, but it's more of a newer thing, so you gotta double check with your patients. All right, so there's a couple of terms that we use when we have a pacemaker. And I will tell you that I struggled with this concept really, really badly. And I had to actually, the picture I have here is what was in my head every time I hear the phrases. So hopefully this will help you and you won't struggle like I did. But we have capture. When your pacemaker is capturing, that means that the heart is looking at the pacemaker and any of the electrical impulses that come from that pacemaker, the heart sees it and reacts to it. So capture means the heart is looking at those electrical impulses from the pacemaker. It sees the pacemaker and it's reacting to that pacemaker. Then we have sensing, and that's when the pacemaker sees the heart. So the heart decides, you know what, I'm gonna throw a little beat in here. And it throws a beat, like a PVC, premature ventricular contraction, or it decides to just beat on its own and it has its own QRS. The pacemaker senses that and says, oh, it beat on its own, let me not screw it up. Because if the pacemaker shocks the heart while the heart is in its own electrical activity and it has its own intrinsic function, then it can actually throw the heart into a lethal, lethal rhythm. So it's important that your pacemaker senses. So we've got the heart seeing the pacemaker as capture and sensing as the pacemaker looking at the heart and saying, oh, you threw a beat. Oh, you didn't throw a beat. Most of the time, pacemakers will have both capturing and sensing capabilities. Then we have the terms that confused me really badly. Failure to capture. So that's when the heart is not looking at the pacemaker. So that pacemaker is throwing signals at the heart and the heart's ignoring it. It's just looking away. I am not capturing what you're sending me. And then there's also failure to sense. And failure to sense is when the pacemaker is not looking at the heart. So the heart's throwing electrical activity and it's beating, but the pacemaker is ignoring it. It's looking away, it doesn't sense it at all. So failure to capture, the heart does not sense, or not gonna use the word sense, Failure to capture, the heart is not capturing those electrical activity. That electric, electrical activity is not enough for the heart to capture that, to throw a beat. And failure to sense is when the pacemaker does not see that the heart is doing its thing on its own. Okay. So I'm gonna show you part of this video this is actually the defibrillator. It looks very similar to what we use. It's actually, I think, the same one. But I'm gonna play part of this video with the sound off. Um, and it's gonna, I'm gonna show you how capturing works. Let me get to... Okay, so this patient right now is in a sinus Brady rhythm. 30, a beat, a heart rate of 30, so the heart is beating 30 times a minute, is not enough for the body to um, get enough blood. If you see here, it looks like this patient is actually in some sort of block. You see little P waves here. Might be even secondary, or second degree block. How, at any rate, 
30 is way too slow for a patient. So oftentimes we can do what's called transcutaneous pacing. That's when we send electrical impulses through the skin to the heart, often in the forms of putting uh, defibrillator pads on the patient and hooking them up to our defibrillator. I have done this once on a patient and she actually was able to feel the little electrical impulses and she was telling me it felt like a string was just pulling every time her heart got shocked because it's what it is it's little tiny shocks to kick start that heart muscle to get it to contract so when you are pacing your patient or what a pacemaker does is it sends these electrical impulses at a set rate so what you're going to see in this video is she sets it to a rate of 60. And 60 to 100 is normal sinus. You can turn up the rate just so that your patient uh, becomes, your patient is not symptomatic for bradycardia. Once you have your set rate, you start turning up the current. So this makes that electrical impulse through the skin stronger and stronger. As you turn up that current, you're going to see what's called pacer spikes. And here, on this monitor, here, oh, here, ah, oh, come on. Oh, it won't let me show you on the video. You'll just have to look at my mouse. So here you see a pacer spike, here you see a pacer spike, here you see a pacer spike. Right now, remember what I just said about the capturing and censoring, sensing. Right now, this heart that we are trying to pace is not capturing the electrical activity. If it was, then these pacer spikes would cause a QRS complex to follow. That means that this electrical impulse from the pacer or pacemaker or the pacer machine, whatever you use, is not strong enough to cause the ventricles to contract. A QRS means that the ventricles are depolarizing to contract. So we need to have each of these pacer spikes have a QRS. So we keep turning up that current, we keep turning it up, and then what you'll see is you'll see, let me see if I can stop it at a better view. Okay. Each pacer spike, so each of these pacer spikes now has a QRS. That means that you are sensing, you are capturing, your heart is capturing those electrical impulses and contracting, depolarizing, contracting because it depolarized and it's pumping blood at a rate of 80. Each pacer spike should have a QRS. So that is what happens when we start getting the heart to capture that electrical impulse from a pacemaker, whether it's temporary or permanent. A lot of times when a patient comes out from heart surgery, you can have reperfusion rhythms and arrhythmias, and the patient will have temporary pacer wires placed within the heart or um, in certain areas of the heart so that if your patient after surgery, like right after surgery, has an arrhythmia or a it need a slower rate, we can actually switch it on, plug those wires into a box, switch on a current, and pace that patient. And then after they're out of a window and they're starting to heal more, the doctor will pull those wires out. Okay. So. Pacemakers also have names or codes. So we're going to talk a little bit about that because it's important to know what your, pace, your patient's pacemaker does. They have a pacemaker, they have an AICD, so we know that this heart is being paced and it has the ability to shock the heart if needed. But what is being paced? Is it a single chamber, 
Is it a dual chamber? Is it uh, both ventricles? That's what we have the pacemaker code or naming pacemakers. That code is going to tell us what each pacemaker does. And everyone who has a pacemaker should be carrying a card on in their wallet or in their purse or whatever they carry around with them. So that way when they come across an emergency or if they need to go through something that has metal detection or whatnot, they're able to show that card saying that they have an implant, implanted medical device. So there's five letters. Sorry, four to five letters for e when we name our pacemakers. So the first letter is going to be what chamber is being paced. The second letter is going to be what chamber is being sensed. So what chamber is getting the electrical impulse? What chamber is the pacemaker looking at for the response? What are they going to do when they send something? So this third letter, it can be, it could be either a triggering event, it could be an inhibiting event, or it could be either a triggering or inhibiting event. For the chambers, we got A and V, atria and ventricles. For that third letter, the response to a sensed event it could be a triggering, it could fire an impulse, or inhibit, stop an impulse from happening. Sorry. Or it can do both, trigger and inhibit. The fourth letter tells us rate responsive features. And this is what is very, very cool about pacemakers, is that we are now at a point in medicine, which it's been around for a little bit, but it can pick up on physiological and non-physiological signs and then increase the heart rate. So let's say you have a pacemaker, it's set to go off at 70 beats per minute or 65 beats per minute, but you decide, you know what, I'm gonna go take a walk with my family. In a, in a normal human being without a pacemaker, your heart rate's gonna naturally go up. Well, if your heart is, is sick or damaged in a way where you're not going to get that heart rhythm and you need a pacemaker to, to set that rate for your heart, your pacemaker has to respond as well. So when you go for that walk and you have a pacemaker, the pacemaker will pick up on the signs that we're about to go for a walk, that we are walking, that we are exercising, and it'll increase that rate automatically because it is responsive to your body. That to me is just, it is so cool. No longer are these people having to stay out of activities that they would normally do if they had a healthy heart. Now they can go out and do everything that they would normally because their pacemaker is able to respond. That's just so neat to me. And then the fifth letter, sometimes you won't have this, but that fifth letter is the, the shocking portion. Does it have shock or does it not? So this is a better way. It might be easier to, for you to uh, um, remember, but letter one is the chamber pace and it could be a, the atrium, the ventricle, or it could be both dual. Then we've got the letter two, which is which one is sensed, the atrium, the ventricle, or the dual, both of them. What do they do when they sense? What does the pacemaker do when it senses an event? Does it trigger an impulse? Does it inhibit an impulse? Or does it both inhibit the atrium and ventricle? And then here, letter four, the fourth letter is what, um, what is its rate responsive feature? And then we've got the pacing shock or both pace and shock. So what I wanna do is kind of give you an example of what you'll see. So sometimes you'll see that a pacemaker has 
this, A, A, I. And that, what, what that means is that the chamber that the pacemaker is pacing is the atrium. It senses atrial activity and it inhibits it inhibits a, an electrical impulse if it senses a senses an event in the atrium. For example, like if they if it notices a complex like a PAC, a premature atrial contraction, or a PVC, premature ventricle uh, contraction, it will sense that and stop it, inhibit an impulse from going. Here's another one, A, zero, zero. So zero means none. So this means that this is a pacemaker that is strictly um, pacing the atrium. And then one more, this is a common one. Triple D, DDD. That means that both chambers are paced, both chambers are being sensed, and both are going to be inhibited if it, the uh, pacemaker senses something from either one. So those, this is the one that I see commonly. And it's about 50-50, my patients, 50%, this is a rough estimate, but 50% have an AICD with a pacemaker, a, a combination one, and about 50% just have a pacemaker. It's important to figure that out though. Okay, what do I have next? I think we're gonna start going over our review. One thing I wanna let you know is when a patient has a pacemaker, when a patient expires with a pacemaker, it's really important to deactivate that pacemaker. You don't do it without a doctor's order, but if you put a magnet and set it on that pacemaker, um, after a while it'll shut the pacemaker off. So just remember if you have a patient and they're about to expire, make sure you talk to the doctor about that because it's still going, it, the pacemaker is still going to work. Um, it's still going to send electrical impulses to the heart. And if it's an AICD, it will also, if the patient is in V-fib or a lethal rhythm that it feels it needs a shock, then it will shock it. But you want to make sure you talk to the doctor about disabling that pacemaker if your patient is about to expire. I love polars. They're so good. If you're not a seltzer water drinker, I would try one because it tastes like, I don't know, it tastes, it tastes good. If you're a seltzer water drinker, you should try some Polars. They're really good, especially Polar Aids. They look like this. It's good. Really good. And they have, my favorite is the blood orange one. Anyway, okay, now we're going to go to show you what they look on e like on EKGs. So this one is a dual chamber pacemaker. Here you see the spike here. This is what your P wave would be or what your P wave should be following. And then here you see another spike. This spike here, that one is causing your QRS. So here's pacer spike. Here's a pacer spike, okay? P wave causing the ventricles to contract. So you see that all the way down. And sometimes on your machine, you're, I'll show you in a second, but you're gonna just see a line where, you, where the leads pick up an electrical impulse from a pacemaker. Okay, so, 
here we're going to here we see the pacer spikes you see this here pacer spike pacer spike pacer spike here's a pacer spike here's a pacer spike this one is just a you don't see any um, atrial pacer spikes so this one is just a biventricular pacemaker and here this is what you'll see on your monitor if you have a monitor hooked up and you're not running a strip your monitor is going to have these pacer spikes and sometimes you'll get a patient and it's going to especially some of the older ones it's going to pick up a lot of artifact and you'll see a bunch of spikes it'll just be like this you're like holy cow but that's artifact it's not really throwing that many pacer um, impulses electrical impulses but this is what you're going to see is you're going to see these pacer spikes and they're just going to look like lines the monitors i have at work just have a line where the the leads pick up the electrical impulse i think i have a cartoon too yep again i'm a nerd so this guy is putting in an implantable defibrillator that will not only shock the patient but also will poke them on facebook this also i just realized is aging me a little bit because i don't think you can poke on facebook for any of you who are og facebook users you'll remember there was a function that you can poke people for whatever reason i don't know why but you would just it was kind of like the a wave i guess i don't know you found someone you would just press this little button that says poke them and you poke them <laughs> that was it that was all it was there was no reason for it i don't know check if you're alive i don't know any rate when facebook was just a baby all right so this is what a pacer is going to look like a pacemaker is going to look like on an ekg so this person is dual paced right you can see tiny tiny little pacer spikes baby pacer spikes here's a pacer spike see here so this guy is av paced dual paced you see them all all right any questions about 15 lead and pacers before we move on to our review in this review we're going to go from the very beginning of our ekgs and rhythms to now it's going to be a brief summary but i want you feel free to take pictures i'll leave the slides up for a little bit so that you can kind of take pictures so that you remember let's start with how to read an EKG. You want to first look at the rhythm. Is it regular or is it irregular? When you look at the QRSs, when you march them out, you take a piece of paper and march them out. Is it regular? Are they evenly spaced? Or are they not evenly spaced? Is it just sporadic? That's regular, irregular. Is the rhythm regular, or irregular? First question to ask. Are there P waves? Second question. Are there P waves visible? Are there QRS complexes? Does each P wave have a QRS complex? Each P wave should have a QRS complex. The P wave is atrial depolarization, which should travel down to the AV node, then travel down to the ventricles causing a QRS complex, which is depolarization of the ventricles. So every P wave should have a QRS complex. What is the PR interval? Remember in heart block, like first degree heart block, our PR, PR interval is going to be long. It's going to be greater than two. So you want to look at your PR interval, if you have a PR interval. And then does everything return to the isoelectric line? If we have elevations or depressions anywhere, that means that we have some injury or ischemia going on in the cardiac muscle. 
So everything should return to the isoelectric arm line. All right, now we're going to talk about and review over 12 leads. So remember, each lead looks, each lead travels, looks at the heart from a different angle. Every lead shows the heart at a different angle. So lead one, that's going from the right arm to the left arm, lead one, looks at the high lateral wall of the heart. Lead two goes from the right shoulder down to the left leg, and that looks at the inferior heart. Looks at the inferior heart. Lead three also looks at the inferior heart. So we've got high lateral inferior. Now we have AVR, so now we're looking at the center of the heart out. So we got AVR, we're looking out towards the right atrium, towards that right shoulder lead. We got AVL, it's looking at that lateral heart, looking at the lateral heart. Then you got AVF, right? AV foot. You're looking down, inferior. Looking down, inferior, at the bottom of the heart. Okay. Now we're looking at the 12 lead. We're going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all across here. V1, V2 is looking at the septum, the middle of the heart, that part of the wall that separates the atriums and ventricles from each other. Then we've got 2, 3, 4. They're looking at the front of the heart. We've got 5 and 6. They're looking at the lateral, the side of the heart here, the left side of the heart. We've got V4 over here. If we take that fourth lead, move it over here, we're looking at the right side of the heart or the right atrium and ventricle, so right side. And then we've got the posterior, which I don't know if I can show you. Let's see. Let's see if I can. It's going to be back here. We're going to look at the posterior part of the heart, V8 and V9. Paparazzi. The heart has all these different angles that it's getting pictures taken. So the heart has its paparazzi of the 12 lead and 15 lead. So sinus rhythms. Oh, I, I wanted to leave that up for you. Sorry. Take a picture. Make notes. But this is how you read an EKG and then what the 12 and 15 lead. And remember, too, with the 12 lead that you have family groups, right? You have contiguous leads or family leads. And anything that is similar to each other is what is going to tell us where the injury is. So we've got those laterals, so 1, ABF, and then 5 and 6. All those should show injury. In, if there's an injury in the lateral side because they're all showing the same part of the heart. Maybe different angles or amplitudes, but it's showing that side. Two, two three, and ABF should all show injury if it's a post, uh, an inferior injury. Then you've got one, you've got the anterior, two, three, four. You got five and six as family with um, one. So they're all family groups. They stick together. They love each other. All right. Now we're going to talk about our rhythms. We're going to review over our rhythms. So we have sinus rhythms. These are rhythms that are normal, that include our normal sinus. We got a P wave in there. You see our P wave? It's regular. First off, let's start at the beginning. It's regular. Each QRS, if we were to measure these out, have the same distance from each other. We have P waves. We have QRSs. And each P wave has a QRS. And if we were to measure out this interval here, this PR interval, it would be less than 0.2. Everything returns to the isoelectric line. So we are good to go. I want to 
I want to make sure I am consistent with this. Okay. Sometimes when you do it enough, it just clicks. So normal sinus, this is what it looks like. Regular P waves, QRSs, and a short PR interval. Sinus Brady. So this is when you have a sinus rhythm, but it's slow. This one looks like a heart rate of 30. So below 60 is bradycardia or sinus bradycardia. Then we've got sinus tachycardia. That is a sinus rhythm. It's regular. It's got P waves. It, got, it has QRSs, but it's a fast rhythm. Normal is 60 to 100. So anything above 100 would be sinus tachycardia. So those are our sinus rhythms. Let me erase my markings so that you guys can have a clear picture of it. So sinus rhythms are going to have a P wave, a QRS wave. It's going to be regular and you're going to have a short PR interval, less than 2, 0.2, less than 0.2. Let's talk about atrial rhythms now. So we've got AFib or atrial fibrillation. That's when those top parts of the hearts are just quivering. They don't, they're just sporadically just quivering like scared chihuahuas. And your, your heart rhythm is irregular. So if we look at this, we have an irregular heart rhythm. Do we have P waves? No, atrial fibrillation doesn't have P waves because there's no organization up here in the atriums. There's no P waves signaling for the ventricles to do their thing. So once in a while, this fibrillation will send an impulse to the ventricle, and that's when the ventricle will contract. But it's sporadic. Who knows? It's fibrillating. Boom. It sends one. Boom. So it's irregular. No P waves. And then we have two types of AFib. We have rapid ventricular rate. That's where we have a, a heart, an AFib rhythm where the ventricles are contracting fast, too fast. It's over 100. So AFib, RVR, rapid ventricular rate, and then controlled rate. The controlled rate is where it's a normal heart rate, but the patient is in AFib. So we have a heart rate between 60 to 100, it's still irregular. We don't have P waves, but it's controlled. We don't have a fast rate. And then A flutter, my favorite. A flutter is when there is some rhythm, there's some organized activity going on in the atrium. They're just doing their thing. They're fluttering like a butterfly wings. And it's you get this classic sawtooth and your rhythm is, for the most part, you'll have a regular rhythm. So if you were to take and measure these QRSs, it'd be equal distance between each one. Would you have P waves? No, there are no P waves in atrial rhythms. You have these things that look like P waves, but those are your atrial flutter impulses. They're not P waves. And then you have QRX complexes. You don't have a PR interval because there's no P waves. And everything returns to the isoelectric line. So A flutter. You get this sawtooth. They call this sawtooth. This is my favorite. Not exactly a good rhythm, but it's still my favorite. And then you got, whoa. SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. And there's also atrial tachycardia. I'm not going to go into the difference because they're both they're both dangerous if not fixed. So SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. In that you're going to have a regular rhythm. You measure out those QRSs, they're all going to be regular, evenly distanced. But look, there's no P waves. You have no P waves. You have QRSs, 
There's no PR interval because there's no P waves. And everything returns to the isoelectric line at some point. It's hard to figure out where your isoelectric line is though because SVT is very fast. Oftentimes you have a heart rate in 200s. So SVT is going to look like that. I'll leave this up for a little bit so that you guys can take a picture of it or take notes or whatever. But these are your, your common rhythms that you're going to see in your patients all the time. And just while, while I have it up, I'll tell you, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see a QRS, a PQRS, or I'm sorry, QRS complex like this. That's going to be called a PAC. And sometimes you're going to have a wide, weird looking complex, and that's going to be a PVC. It's going to look like this. No, no, ignore that. It's going to look something like that. And that's a pre-ventricular contraction. Okay, let's move on to ventricular rhythms. These are the fun ones. So, We've got VTAC, ventricular tachycardia, and you can have a pulse with this and you can, can have pulseless VTAC. If you have a pulse with this, you still need to get the patient out of this, but um, you have both pulseless VTAC and patients who have VTAC with a pulse. If you don't have a pulse, you shock them. But let's look at this. Is it regular or irregular? It's regular. We've got regular, if we were to measure this out, it'd be regular. Do we have P waves? Uh, I don't really see any. Do we have QRSs? Yeah, they look weird. They're really wide. They're bizarre looking. Wide, bizarre QRSs. Do we have PR interval? No. And does everything return to the isoelectric line? Not really sure. This is this is uh, where the ventricles are really pumping fast. It can become unstable very quickly because during the time where the ventricles are pumping, it's not getting enough refill time to refill with enough blood to send to the body. So eventually you're going to tucker out because you're not getting enough blood flow. Then we've got V-fib, right? V-fib is where the whole heart is just a scared chihuahua. It's just shaken. And there's no organization. There's no P waves, no QRSs. There's, you don't even think with this. You immediately shock that heart. You give it a big slap across the face, get it back organized. Don't slap your patient across the face. Just shock them with, with a defibrillator. And then we've got asystole. I want to put this in here because it's not necessarily a, a ventricle rhythm, but I wanted to touch on it. I don't think I touched on it in the other lesson study sessions that we did, but asystole, there is zero electrical activity. If there is zero electrical activity, you cannot shock it. You cannot shock it into an organized rhythm. You cannot reset asystole. You have to get a rhythm going. That's why we push drugs with asystole. We try to get that heart excitable again and spontaneously start a electrical activity that we can work with. But for asystole, it's gonna either be a flat line or you'll see tiny waves. But for the most part, it's there's no electrical activity. You just see the isoelectric line. All right, now we go on to heart blocks. Summarizing everything. Remember, first, remember the, the, the marriage between the P waves and the QRSs, right? Normal sinus, they're all happy. They're in their honeymoon phase. P and QRS love each other. They spend time with each other all the time. Anytime you see P, QRS is right there with them. And there is a very short distance between the P and QRS because they just want to be so close to each other. Well, first degree... Honeymoon phase is over. 
P and Q start drifting apart. P is at home waiting, got dinner ready. QRS comes home late every night because he just doesn't want to come home. He's pretty sick of P. He comes home though because he's married. That's 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 his spouse. So P and QRS, he comes home late. They're they're not as close together anymore. They're not close. Then we got second degree block, and there's two types of second degree block. Mobitz types one and Mobitz type two. So Mobitz one, again, out of the second degree blocks, this is my favorite, Winky Bach, first degree, or I'm sorry, second degree type one. What happens here? Well, P said something to QRS and said, hey, we're in this together, we're, we're married, so get yourself in gear. We need to do this. We need to, we need to work this out. QRS goes, okay. So they're close together, right? P, QRS, QRS comes home to P every night. I'm sorry, start over. So P and QRS, after, after that spat, QRS comes home on time, boom. But then the next night, QRS comes home a little bit later. And then the next night, he comes home even later until one night, he just doesn't come home. Again, P and QRS are short. There's a short PR interval. The next time you see it, it's a little bit longer. The next time you see it, it's a little bit longer than the second one. And then all of a sudden, P is by itself. Winky Bach. Long, longer, or PR, long, longer, drop. PR, long, longer, drop. Type two. That's where P is at home every single time and he doesn't know. They don't know when QRS is, P does not know when QRS is gonna come home. He comes home, QRS comes home to P one night, second night, and then all of a sudden he just doesn't come home. And it's sporadic. P is at home, QRS comes home on time, QR, QRS comes home on time, and then all of a sudden he doesn't come home. This is the more dangerous of the two because if you see here, your rate may not be as um, effective. You have P wave but no QRSs and the QRSs are what is what pumps the blood to the rest of the body. So if you don't have QRSs, you're not pumping blood. So P wave, QRS comes home to P wave one night, another night, and then just doesn't come home. Well now, P has had it, absolutely had it. And now they're separated. P's like, you know what? You don't come home on time, I'm done with you. So now P is over here doing their own thing. QRS is over here doing their own thing. So if you march this out, every P wave is gonna be equally distanced from one another. Every QRS is gonna be equally distanced from one another, but the P waves don't always have a QRS. So, let's go back to first degree. Is it regular? Yes, it's regular. Are there P waves? Yes. Here's our P waves, right? Does every QRS ha or does every P wave have a QRS? Yep. Every P wave has a QRS. What is a PR interval? In first degree block, your PR interval is going to be greater than Point two. It's milliseconds. All right, second degree. Is it regular? No. Do you see that? There's a long pause here. So we're irregular. Are there P waves? Yep, there's P waves. See all these P waves? Are there QRSs? Yeah, there's QRSs here. Does every P have a QRS? Nope. This P wave doesn't have QRS. This P wave doesn't have QRS. So what is our PR interval? Well, here it's nice and short. Here it's a little bit longer. Here it's even longer, and this one doesn't have one. So we have a second degree block, type one. Let's look at this one. Is it regular or irregular? It's irregular. Long spaces between these QRSs. Do we have P waves? Yep. P waves. 
Do we have QRSs? Yeah, there's QRSs. Does every P wave have a QRS? No. Here's P waves without QRSs. What is the PR interval? Well, it's the same for each one of these. So we're dropping beats. So we're second degree. We're type two because each PR interval is the same. All right, how about third degree? Are we regular or irregular? We're regular, right? These are these QRSs all march out. Are there P waves? Yes. Here's your P waves. Do you have QRSs? Yes. They look funky, but there are QRSs. And does each P wave have a QRS? Nope. Look, there's P waves doing their own thing. So, PR intervals. It's sporadic, right? But if we were to march these out, march out the P waves, march out the QRSs, we would see that they don't line up. So we've got third degree block, complete heart block. They're not talking to each other whatsoever. Okay, now we got our bundle branch blocks. These are a little bit more difficult and this is what you'll see on, on your 12 leads. Not necessarily on a strip like this. For right heart block, you look in V1, you're going to see an RSR. So you're going to see an up re reflection, your S, and then another R. So you have two R's instead of a QRS. No downward inflection at all. You have an R, S, R. In lead V6, you're going to see a wide S. Do you see that? Where's my pen? Okay, here we go. Ah, your S is wide like the, Q, uh, the QR, wide S. So RSR, QRS, long S. Left bundle branch block, V1, you're not gonna have any Q wave. See, there's no Q wave, no Q wave you have this wide RS. And then in V6, you're gonna have that classic bunny ears, your monomorph monomorphic R. You see how these R's are pretty close together? No Q's, but you have an RSR, but the R is the same as the other R. So in right bundle branch block, the R's are not the same. And in the left bundle branch block, the R's are monomorphic. Oh, you want to take a picture of that? Did you guys get enough time to take a picture of the this one? Okay. Heart blocks. Blah 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 blah. Okay. Take a quick picture of that, or take notes, whatever you want to do. And then last. Last, hold on. I think that was it. No, paste. Ugh. Okay. So, you got atrial paste. That's where you have your pacer spikes before your P waves. And that is enough to cause the heart to contract. You've got ventricular paste where you have the spikes and it causes QRS complexes. And then you have AV pace where you have an atrial pacer spike and a ventricle pacer spike, both of them. Remember our failure to capture, failure to sense. So here we have a failure to capture. That pacemaker sent something to the heart, but the heart wasn't looking at it. It was looking the other way. So the heart didn't do what it was supposed to do. It didn't depolarize and contract. So it was, it failed to capture that electrical impulse. And then here you can see that that pacemaker is sensing. So normally you would have your pacer spikes at regular intervals. However, it said, Oh, look, the heart did something. Oh, look, 
the heart did its own thing. So it did not send an electrical impulse because the heart set it, sent its own impulse, caused a contraction, and so then it just continues with its regularly scheduled program if it doesn't sense another electrical activity from the heart. And then we have a failure to sense. That's when the pacemaker does not see that the heart did its thing. And if you see here, this is a pacer spike where it should not be. It should be in front. If you see here, this pacer spike isn't while the heart is repolarizing, it's in the middle of that T wave. It should be here. So this pacemaker is failing to look at the heart and see the electrical impulses that the heart is putting out. And that's it for today. Um, yeah, quick review. And next week we'll look at, we'll, what I'll do is we'll look at junctional and idio, idioventricular rhythms and junctional rhythms. And then we'll go ahead and we'll just do a bunch of EKGs, 12 leads. I really do encourage you. There's a ton of programs on Google, or if you Google EKG rhythm tests, there's a ton of them from 12 leads to simple strips. The more you do it, the more it's gonna be second nature. And you're gonna be able to look at a rhythm and know it right away. Please reach out if you have any questions. If you come across a rhythm and you wanna discuss it, please let me know. We'll share it on here. I'll take patient information out. Please do so if you send me any. But I also put my email on Twitch because I've realized that my email wasn't on Twitch. So if you go into about and one of the first panels or badges or whatever the things are called, you'll see email me. So click that email me and that will uh, email me questions or email me any rhythms that you see that are interesting and we'll talk about them. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this stream today. It was a quick review. It was a fun one to talk about. And I'll see you next week. Bye.